Sit, you want to kneel, that's fine, but thank God. Thank God for his faithfulness that never fails one day. Thank him for journey mercies out of town, within town, that you enjoyed his love, his faithfulness leading you. Thank him this morning. Thank him for being very particular about you. There are some very specific things he did for you in this month that is coming to an end. Don't forget to thank him. Very unique to you. You knew definitely this, this was for me. Thank God. Protection while you drove. He just delivered you. You know he did it. Peace where you stay. Thank God.
before we pray for one state, I want you to pray for your state. Just pray for your state and commit it to God. You know or may not know the situation of your state, but pray for your state. Some of you are joined to other states for one reason or the other, growth, marriage. Pray for them. Pray for the peculiarity of the state that you are from, that God will answer according to the issues of your state. He hears, he answers. So talk to him. Pray for Christians in your state to be strong, to stand for truth, that God will help them. As a congregation of God's people, let's pray for Plateau State. May we all talk to God for Plateau State, for peace to return. Rumors of retaliation are everywhere, and you really are not surprised. Pray for Plateau State. Pray for the leadership, especially the Christian leadership, for wisdom on how to direct God's people and on what to do and how to do it. Pray for the governor, the House of Assembly. Our faithful, righteous God intervene. Thank Him for the release of these children in Niger State and some from Bethel Baptist School. Our family week starts today. Let's ask God to visit homes. Start with your home. Ask God to visit your home. Your home definitely can be better. Ask God to visit your home. In visiting your home, he has to visit you first. So ask him to touch your heart. That you might be open and ready to submit to him where you need to submit to him. That we'll not go through these three days till Tuesday. And you don't have something to make your home a better place. So pray for yourself that your heart will be open to receive from God what he has planned for us. Lastly, as a church, let's pray for all the cases Equa has. Let's ask for God to intervene. That all of them will be settled. That he will touch the hearts of all the parties involved. The churches, the individuals, the leaders, that he will touch their hearts. That all of them, God will touch their hearts. That at the end of the day, his name will be glorified. That wherever self, self is driving this, ask God to humble such people. 
ask God to humble those people who are driving this whole very sour taste that we have around us in Equa today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. You have had us. We are sure of that. You would answer. We are sure of that. What we ask of you is to grant us patience to wait for your answer. You know, O oh God, that some of the matters we've laid before you, we have actually run out of patience. Help us. The continuous kidnapping and killing of people. You know, O oh Heavenly Father, that as humans, we have run out of patience. But we know you have heard how you answer. We don't know. We have ways we want you to answer, but you are not us. And we can't dictate to you how to act. We have told you what we desire. It is you that would overrule on how you would respond. Help us to know that you have heard us. And help us to know that you will answer. And help us to know that the wicked can never go unpunished. Because you are a faithful God. How you will deal with them, we don't know. We don't know. And thank you because we don't know. Because it leaves us to just keep trusting you to handle them. It's high, oh God, in our country. Help us, our God and our Father. Thank you for those who are celebrating their birthdays this week, our Father. Our sister Ninda, Doris, our brother Success, our sister Patience, our brother Simon. Kumai, Maria, Michael, bless them, my Heavenly Father. Help that their new year will be better than the year that has passed. Better in knowing you. Better in being better children of yours. That your name will be glorified over their lives. Those who have specific requests before you, education, marriage, business, work, whatever it is, O oh Lord, answer them, O oh Father. And bless, and bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Heavenly Father, for Malaysia. We pray for Trinidad and Tobago. We pray for Slovakia, Vietnam, and San Marino. Who celebrate their national days. We pray especially for your children who are in these nations. Strengthen their work with you. That they will stand for Jesus Christ. We thank you for this meeting this morning. We know that you will glorify yourself. Lord, as we continue this meeting, O oh Lord, May all that we do continue to bring glory and honor to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 14 from verse 1 to 10. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Do the mourn, weep. They say they wail for the land. The cry goes up from Jerusalem. Nobles send their servants to the waters. They go to the they go to the cistern, but find no water. They return with their jars and fill, dismay and despairing. They cover their heads. The ground is cracked because there is no rain in the land. Farmers are dismayed and cover their heads. Even the door in the field, in the field desert, 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 newborn found because there is no grass. Wild donkey stands on the barren heights and pants like jackals. Their eyes fail for lack of food. Although our sins testify against us, do something, Lord, do something, Lord, for the sake of your name. For we, for we have often rebelled. We have sinned against you. 
you, you who, you who are the hope of Israel, the savior, the savior in times of distress, why are you like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who stays only a night? Why are you like a man taken by surprise, like a warrior powerless to flee? You are among us, God, and we bear your name, not forsake us. This is what the Lord says about his people. They, they, they greatly love to wander. They do, they do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Good morning, church. Can we please rise as we take the congregational hymn? The hymn is on the bulletin, the front and the back page of your bulletin. Let me welcome our visitors before we go into 
what God has laid in my heart this morning concerning our homes. Welcome to church again this morning, and good to have all of us here. Thank you for coming. I want to recognize those who are worshiping with us for the very first time. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, some people may mind, but if you don't mind, please just raise your hand wherever you are. If this is the first time you are worshiping here, if you are in the hall or outside, please just raise your hand wherever you are. The ushers will give you a card. We're promising you are not going to be bothered. It's just to know you a little more personally in the course of the service. Some people will welcome you on our behalf and um, just pray with you if there's a request. So please just raise your hand and make sure you get the card before you put your hand down. Make sure they see your hand. There are two hands in front here, so please just give them. I hope those outside, okay. Some people are still trying to make up their minds. Just keep your hand up a bit. They'll give you a card, all right? There's one person in front here. Thank you very much for coming. And welcome to all of us who are regular worshipers here. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, sorry, our we are, we are between a church and a site, but um, with time we will have all of this place cleaned up. For those of you park outside, sorry for the about the inconveniences in parking. We had to put some of our materials outside, so we apologize that it's not as comfortable as it used to be. Before we read God's word, my Bible is going to be open to Nehemiah chapter 14, not chapter 4, and that's where we're going to start our week this morning from, in Nehemiah chapter 4. But before we go there, as you find Nehemiah chapter 4, let me draw your attention, I hope, You see, let me draw your attention. So Nehemiah chapter 4, you can open it, and then I want to ask something, and then we would read one verse in Nehemiah chapter 4. The song that's on this bulletin, how many of us have sang it before? This is not your first time. This is not your first time. Okay. Are you sure? This is not your first time. How many of us are leaving what we used to sing? I didn't sing because I just knew that something's wrong. With me, not with you. We sing the songs that we sing with joy and passion. And it's like when we sing, we just sing for singing's sake. And then we go out and then we forget. If you read what you sang, it's a message on its own. We can close and go home. How is your home? How is your home? Homes where the father is true and strong. Homes that are free from blight. Homes where the mother, in caring quest, strives to show others your way. <laughs> not my way, not our way, but that your way is best. Home where the Lord is an honored guest. Technology and innovation and have changed the way we decorate our homes. I've told you this over and over again. We used to have cotton boxes in our homes in those days. You remember those cotton boxes? And on top of those cotton boxes, we used to have pictures of grandpa and mommy and daddy. And in the most Christian homes, there used to be this write-up. Christ is the head of this house. The unseen guest, the silent listener to every conversation. Can he visit your home? Is there peace in your home? Maybe when we took those things away, we also took this kind of semblance of his presence. And so today, we put pictures. And like I've told you, some of the pictures, we don't even know why we put them. Because we don't know what they, what they mean. We just put them. It's, it's art. It's just, it's, it's just painting. <laughs> we don't know what they mean. I, I'm not, I don't connote anything is wrong with it, but maybe some of those things on our walls was a reminder to some of us. Because I assure you, I'm not sure in this church and maybe in other homes that the, what we sang today is true in our lives. Some of us are young people, yes. It's how you prepare now that will determine how it will be tomorrow. So the things we sang, if we are going to be judged only on the things we sang, how is your home? How is your home, dear father? Proud father. Excited father. How is your home? How do your children see you? Do, they re do you reflect the way of Christ to them? 
How is your home, dear mother? Oh, yeah, food is always available. The house is always clean. Nice. But not, not just that it's always clean, it has a very lovely, welcoming smell. But the heart in the house, are we a home? Or we're just existing, we're just cohabiting. So how is your home? In Nehemiah chapter 4, the verse is verse 14 this morning. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14. And at the point I will ask, I hope the media will be able to put it up for us. But Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14. After I looked things over, Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your family, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your home. It's one of the verses I like the King James. It's one of the verses I like the King James. If you, like, if you open the King James, it says, The Lord who is great and terrible. He's great and terrible. If you have a King James, is that what it says? He's great and terrible. The, the context of what he's talking about is the awesome power of God. But draw your attention, if you may, to what he says. He says, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord your God and do what who is great and awesome. And fight for what? Fight for your family. Sadly, we've changed this verse in our time. We don't fight for our families. We fight with our family. So husbands are fighting wives. Wives are fighting husbands. Children are fighting parents. Parents are fighting children. We are not fighting for the family. We are fighting with our families. In-laws are fighting in-laws. Outlaws are fighting in-laws. Relations are fighting. Whichever name and nomenclature, we have changed this verse. Nehemiah told them in the midst of what they were facing to fight for their families, not to fight with their families. The principle we want to draw this morning is, are you fighting for your family or are you fighting with your family? And this morning, my topic is to fight for your family. And the, the, the question is, are you fighting for or are you fighting with your family? And as an assignment, I want us to recite and I would say it again and again. And don't get tired. Say it as much as you can. And this is what I want us to say. So that we go with this verse and it, it sticks to us. I will not fight with my family. I will fight for my family. Can we say that together? I will not fight with my family. I will fight for my family. Tell yourself, I will not fight with my family. I will fight. Say it again. Looking at your faces, I'm sure some of us here, yeah, this is already enough sermon. We can go home right now. Because we are fighting with our families. Will there be conflict? Yes. But we will settle. But where there's a continuous fighting, something is wrong. Nehemiah tells the children of God, fight for your family. May we pray as we go to God's word this morning. Father, help us that what we have said will be real in our lives. Help us that we would fight for our families, not with our family. In Jesus' name. I will save you all the statistics. I will save you, but I will give you a hint of what's going on. There's a major attack on the family of the day, and there's a major, major attack that the traditional family of today is, 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 is bad. There's an interview. I wanted to play it, but maybe in the course of the week, I'll play it, that Pess Morgan did with one, I don't know what to place that guy. It's, 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 it's a very funny interview. They, they, they live in a family where they don't refer to their kids as he or she, but it, they. They, don't, they, they, don't, they, say they, they say they don't discuss sexuality with their children. They have a very funny, interesting relationship. The guy, the guy, 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 I don't know whether he's a guy or a girl. He's married to somebody, and then he has an another open relationship with somebody who is living in that same house. And in that whole system, they have children. It's a, it's a very nauseating. If you cannot stand it, please don't go and look for it. But Pierce Morgan was the one that did it. I think it's on ITV. He did that interview. It's on YouTube. I'll try and get it for you. That's one attack on the family. There's the other attack on the family that is even within the church and the, the, the things that we do that don't help the family. There's an attack on the family that the traditional family has always been male-dominated. 
and has suppressed and pressed women so that women cannot express themselves. You don't blame them. We don't blame them. Because we have not read and obeyed, especially as men, where it says, submit ye to one another. We are quick to say, women, do what? Submit to your husbands and fail to realize that it says, husbands, love your wives, how? As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for him. And so I always ask men, if your wife slaps you, will heaven fall down? If your wife slaps you, will heaven fall down? I'm sure if it was possible, God would fall with heaven. But they say, the Bible says, love your wives as Christ loved the church so that the church that he was dying for slapped him and heaven didn't fall. Instead, he said, Father, forgive them <laughs> for they know not what they do. We as men have been more concerned with our ego and our personality and fail to realize that the example of humility that Christ gives us is a heavy task upon us and yet we don't want to do that part. And we always say where there's love, submission is easy but it's been difficult for us. <laughs> Nehemiah is writing in this place and he tells us this very, very difficult word if you ask me. The children of Israel were in captivity. About 70 years they were in captivity. They were returning now to their land. Nehemiah was leading the third group of people. And as he was leading the third group of people, Nehemiah's concern as at this time was how to rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem because it was a picture of their security. But then Nehemiah led these people and Jerusalem was in ruins. His job was to mobilize the people so that they can build the walls. In chapter 1, Nehemiah prays, God answers his prayer. He gives him a time before the king. In chapter 2, God moved Nehemiah with the prosperity of Persia to the dissolution of, of, of Jerusalem. God gave him all the favor that he needed as he prayed and God led him. In chapter 3, we are introduced to the building of the wall and the walkers. We see that no one can do everything, but everyone coming together can do something. And the little bit everybody does was going to help in the rebuilding of the wall. Everyone was working hard. Everyone was doing their own bit. Everyone was constructing what they could construct and putting together what they could put together so that the walls could be built. Work was going well. When we arrive chapter 4, in some of your, in your Bibles, the heading of chapter 4 is what? Opposition, discouragement to the building of the walls. Discouragement. We now see these people struggling. Now when we come to chapter 4, discouragement sets in. And in our homes, we will draw lessons from this Nehemiah story to learn so that we can fight for our homes, so that we can confidently say, I will not fight with my family, I will fight for my family. Two types of discouragement set in. And these two main types of discouragement, we also face them. One is from outside, discouragement that comes from outside, and then there's the discouragement that comes from inside. The outside discouragement, the walls, the walkers were initially excited. They were enjoying the walk. Chapter 4 and verse 6 says that the people walked with all their heart. They were excited. Why? They were building the walls. Things were going well. The people were happy. The wall was going up. But then something happened. Something happened because getting the walk started on the walls was exciting. A new thing was done. Something that, that they prayed to happen began to happen. A major achievement was taking place. But keeping that and sustaining that joy became a problem. Because you see, when God begins to move and God begins to walk, Satan is also around to see how he can introduce discouragement and bring things in the wrong direction. And so our homes are. We started out very happily. Very few homes. In fact, there are very few homes that didn't start with joy. Plenty of dancing, plenty of celebration, plenty of spending, plenty of eating. There was excitement. But how has it been now? Everybody's calm. Discouragement has set in. Just like these guys, discouragement has set in. The excitement is gone. And everything appears that it's not going well anymore. Because Satan brought in two people that brought in discouragement. 
This human enemies, chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 2, tell us this human enemies, their names. One says, the Bible says, when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And then they got so angry that they surrounded the walls, surrounded the walkers. Note also, my brothers and my sisters, that when God was leading them, God allowed Tobias and Sambalat to be alive. Why? Hardly do you read through scripture of anybody that God leads that doesn't meet challenges on the journey of his faith. Hardly do you read scripture. So I wonder where we get this illusion from that when you become a Christian, everything is taken away. Hardly. They were building the wall. God was leading them, granted them favor. He got the letters that he needed. He got the resources that he needed. He went and God still allowed these two guys to bring troubles for them. Conflict will come, challenges will come, and in our homes as well, our joy was high. We were excited, we were joyful, and, and, and the homes started well. There was joy. Some of us are looking forward to that joy. Let me assure you that when the joy comes, be rest assured that as we pray for that day to come for you, we will also pray for you to have the skin and the strength so that when challenges come, you will stand. There are many homes that are disintegrating in our generation and in our time, and it's not far from the church. They are disintegrating because when they started, they were all happy. They thought it was going to be a bed of roses, but they forgot that even roses have thorns on them. And so you have to resolve today, and I pray you resolve that whether you're in a home now, or you'll be in a home in the future, or you're in a home now taking care of people, I pray you will resolve, I will not fight with my family, I will fight for my family. The external attack started. Satan shoots this external attack and he begins to attack them and he brings discouragement to them. And they saw these enemies and it was not comfortable building anymore. Satan keeps attacking. But then there's the internal one, the internal attack. There's an African proverb I, I, I have heard so many times. I didn't know it was African, but I found out it was an African proverb, and this is what the African proverb says. It says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. If there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Let me say that again. If there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. So these guys started having the enemy within. And that gave leverage to the enemies outside. The first thing we see is that these people who started joyfully, the first enemy that struck them was fatigue. Look at verse 10 of chapter 4. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. The strength of the laborers, simply put, the workers were tired. They were hitting hard and they needed some rest. The phrase giving out carries with it the idea of staggering, stumbling. It was becoming a, a strenuous activity. And when you are physically drained, it is very easy to become discouraged at the slightest problem. It's also interesting to notice that when the workers began, became fatigued and discouraged, they had gone to a certain point. Look at verse 6, if you may. So we built the wall till all of it reached half its height. So they had built to half. Excitement had taken them to halfway of the walk. And halfway into the walk, fatigue came in. They were tired. And that's what happens when you start a family. Everything feels real. Or very things looks optimistic. Everything looks okay. Discouragement sets in through Satan. And Satan knows that halfway, he will strike with discouragement. And you begin to ask yourselves questions. There's a study that if we do, if you go through marital counseling, it takes you through. There are people who have more faces, but the one I'm used to is the faces, the seven faces of marital adjustment. It starts with excitement, goes to the neutral stage. And then when you go to the neutral stage, you come to the runaway stage. From the runaway stage, you get to the divorce stage. From the divorce stage, you get to the marriage stage. It's something about that number. But the interesting thing is between the runaway stage and the divorce stage depends on how long you stay. Immediately you cross the divorce stage, you get to the stage of marriage. That's the danger because many people never cross the divorce stage. 
but they fail to realize that just after the divorce stage is married. So let me encourage you. If you are in a difficult situation and it looks as if all hell is breaking loose, you're just about the place of rest. You're very close to the place of rest. You're going through the circle. And let me remind you that you will go through the circle again. Have you ever wondered why people look at women and they say, ah, what's the problem? All women are the same. Have you heard that statement before? Have you ever wondered why women will look at guys and they say, hmm, all men are the same. And you ask them, when did you do these analysis? How did you arrive at the figures that all of them are the same? And I can tell you why. I can tell you why. Because when you leave one relationship and you go to another relationship, you think you've gone to a better relationship. You've only changed the person. The circle continues. You will be joyful, and then it will become normal, and then it will, it will start swinging, and it will go up, and it will come down. It's normal. You can go. In fact, I promise you, you can leave Nigeria and get somebody from the Caribbeans. If you like the Brazilians, you know, they're very lovely women there, you will go through the circle again. Or if I, oh, oh, oh sorry, let me not be particular to the men. You can, for the women, you can go to France. You know, they have some very, very, you don't know whether they're men, women, but they're just handsome. You know that kind of attraction? Not this... Some, 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 some of us around here, you know, they're just managing to accept us, uh, you know. You will go through the circle. You cannot escape the circle. And so when you get halfway, they got halfway and fatigue set in. And when fatigue set in, they became discouraged. They became discouraged. The newness of what they were doing had weared off. Work became routine. It became boring, nothing new. They couldn't spice up what they had anymore. And it's easy to become fatigued. Look at verse 10. We cannot rebuild the wall. They were ready to throw in the towel. The same people who in verse 6 we read that they walked with all their heart. In verse 10 says we can't walk anymore. And some of you have gotten to that point in your home. That way you said no. No, we started well. What happened? Nothing happened. You are going through the motion. But most likely you are fighting with. You are not fighting for. You are fighting with. I will show you who I am in this house. I'm the man. Who is providing food here? I will show you who I am. No. Let's walk together so that we'll be happier. That's fighting for. I will tell you that this wife that you married, check my mother. If my father gives you how, you know my father is a very special man. How he handled my mother. Check, check, where I'm, check my family. Oh. Check my family. You are fighting with you are not fighting for. And I'm praying for myself that I fight for, I don't fight with. And I pray that as you get ready for your own home, for those of you who are still praying to get married, that you make it clear that every step of the way you will fight for, you will not fight with. They were tired. The people who started with joy, and many who were here, they started with joy. But they've plateaued, no joy. Oh, this evening we're going to talk to only couples. Spice the joy up. Find a way. Oh, no! Oh, forget. There's nothing new. After 20 years of marriage, what else do you want to show me? There's still something. There's still something you can do to keep yourself going. But if you're fighting with... <laughs> He will never find something new. He will only find a new reason to fight. And I assure you, if you think you are not fighting with, you are fighting for, check. If every time something comes up, there's a new reason to fight, you are fighting with. You are not fighting for. Some of us are fatigued. We are discouraged. I pray that as you resolve to fight for and not fight with, it will encourage and strengthen your home in Jesus' name. Fatigue set in. And when fatigue set in, they were frustrated. Any voice of discouragement from outside will say, after all, it's true. Because the enemy within, the enemy within opens the door for the enemy outside. If there's no enemy inside, the enemy outside can do us no harm. The next thing we see that happens to these people is frustration, which is normal. Look at verse 10, if you may. There is no, there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. There's so much rubble, they say, that we cannot rebuild the wall. So much rubble? Really? So much rubble. So much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Rubble was everywhere. It hindered their work. 
Everywhere they went, broken rocks, dirt was there, dry mortar was there, sand was everywhere, debris was everywhere. Everywhere was filled with all kinds of dirt. And now, the people who were building, you want to understand, they didn't change location. The same spot they started building, all of a sudden, they noticed that there was rubble in the place where they were building. And rubble is dirt and all, of, all the things that we, we, we see around as, we, as, 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 as you go to a site. Those rubbles now started disturbing their work. And so they were discouraged. They were frustrated. There's probably some level of dysfunction in your home. Rubble everywhere. Rubbles everywhere. Maybe you're with an abusive spouse. Maybe you're someone with bitterness issues in your home. Or a defensive spouse. I, I found out that there, there are some spouses that are defensive. Everything, they defend themselves. They, they don't give in, they defend themselves. It's their way or the highway. It feels all too overwhelming. Frustration is setting in. You've tried and it looks as if everything is over. You cannot take it anymore. You've moved now from fatigue. Frustration has set in. Just like these guys, frustration has set in. And in the midst of this frustration, they got angry. The adversaries started attacking them. It became easier for them to be attacked by the adversary because the enemy within was working hard. From frustration, these guys went to fear. They were afraid. Look at verse 12. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us how many times in verse 12? Ten times. That means they kept repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. What were they saying? Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. So fear was now building. These are people who started walking with confidence. These are people who started walking knowing that they had the backing of God and they had the, the power of God behind them. But fear set in. And fear sets in and it spoiled everything. They couldn't walk anymore. I don't think, I don't know, but maybe if we look at all the emotions, I don't think there's anyone as dangerous as fear. Because fear can make you underachieve what you're supposed to achieve. Till this minute, fear, a very simple one that makes you sometimes, if you don't think about it, you, you, you don't know how fun it is. Have you ever wondered why you be in a room, in your house, a room you are used to, you stay all the time, and it's dark in the night, and there's light, you're enjoying the room. It's your room, it's your house, and then the light goes off. Why are you afraid? <laughs> Why are you afraid? Huh? Immediately the light goes off. Are you yourself? Hello? Are you normal? It's your room. You can almost walk without light. When you wake up to go ease yourself, you don't need the light. But when you're conscious of the light and the light goes off, fear sets in. And in the midst of that fear, that's why you have more accidents. <laughs> fear. They were afraid. And because they were afraid, it gave the enemy an opportunity to come in. And some of us are afraid. This is what is going to happen. This is where this thing is going to end. You're already picturing an end that the scripture does not support. Fear has set in. I assure you, you've opened the door for voices that will come in to help you get to that end. Because you're already afraid. Oh, look at what he's doing. Oh, look at what she's doing. No, no, no. No, there's no way. Whatever is happening, this place, I'm going to fight for. I'm not going to fight with. Whatever it is, I'm going to stand. I know it's not easy. I know it's difficult. But I'm going to stand because I stand with a God who has not failed me before. So as I come to a close because of our time, how do we now fight? Nehemiah goes on to tell them how to fight. To keep their family normal, he tells them how to fight. The first thing he tells them is to seek God's help. Seek God's help. Unfortunately, God usually is the last person we look for when trouble starts. But God was the first person Nehemiah looked for when things got bad. You know, 
that I was preparing. You know, some of us remember the story of this luxurious boss that was attacked by armed robbers. And when they told everybody to drop, the armed robbers who were well armed said, men this way, women this way. And among the women, they saw a man and asked the man, are you okay? Men this way, women this way. Why are you here? The guy said, you guys that are armed are the men. All of us here are women. Why? Because what he saw overwhelmed him. And there are some of you sitting down here today. The challenges of your home has overwhelmed you. Have you talked to God? This overwhelmed Israel. They didn't have the capacity to fight these people. They didn't have the power to fight these people. They were, they were sad. And this is what Nehemiah did. And when we get overwhelmed, Nehemiah in chapter 1, we know that prayer. He prayed and prayed. We know that prayer. But the prayer that cuts, that cuts my attention is this. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. We know Nehemiah chapter 1, the prayer that he prayed. But the prayer that, 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 that my attention is on is Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. Are you there? Hello? Are you there? Okay. <laughs> the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of Israel and did what? Verse 5. And I answered the king. When did he pray? <laughs> it tells you that Nehemiah must have been standing there and he had an elaborate prayer in chapter 1. An elaborate prayer. Forgive me. Forgive my sins. Forgive the sins of my family. Forgive the people. An elaborate prayer. He stands before the king and we are told that when the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of Israel and I answered the king. It sounds as if Nehemiah just said, Lord, help me now. King, this is what I want. It sounds as if Nehemiah just, just said, somebody said it's a popcorn prayer. You know what a popcorn is? It just pops up and that's all. There's nothing really in it. He just prayed, and at the point he prayed, and the point is, there are times when you are overwhelmed. There's no time for a long, elaborate prayer. Oh, Lord, help my tongue now. Oh, some of us need that prayer. Oh, Lord, help my emotions now. Now, Lord, help me now. I'm overwhelmed with this. Help me now. But we forget. We forget. And we're quick to respond. Nehemiah didn't respond like that. He said, Lord, please help me. He prayed. He told God something. We don't know what he said, but we are sure. He told God something in front of the challenge and the need that he had. He spoke to God. Oh, God, help us. That when we face challenges, we would remember to say a word of prayer to help us to be calm. Nehemiah sought God. Look at verse 4 of chapter 4. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. One of the things you take away from the book of Nehemiah is how personal Nehemiah prays about the things that were happening. Very personal prayer. He didn't blame anybody. And that's the, 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 the natural thing to do. It's your fault. No, we're in this together. There's no marriage boat that sails on the sea. If it sinks, nobody comes out dry. One person might sink down, but nobody comes out dry. We all will get wet. Nehemiah understood that they could have done, but I did my part. He says, Lord, they've despised us. He prayed to his God. Look at verse 9. But why? But, but we prayed to God and posted a guard day and night because when they prayed, they acted. They prayed and did what they needed to do to keep things going. When you pray, what action do you take? Is there an action fighting with or is there an action fighting for? 
seek God's help. So, so now we remember where we are. Can we say what we said at the beginning together? I will not fight with my family. I will fight for my family. Rally your family. Rally your family. Not only do you seek God, but rally the family. Look at what Nehemiah does next. In Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 13. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places. Posting them how? By families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. He rallied the families around. He gave them the assignment to be done. Nehemiah placed them as families so that they will know where the fight was going to take place. And as families took charge of the areas where he kept them, the community was built. The family was strengthened. The community was built because the wall was built. Rally the family. Apart from your immediate family, you have the church family. Rally them. Call for prayer. Be around them for prayer. And this is so important for our church. Nehemiah rallied them to be available to serve so that together they can build together. In fact, if you read Nehemiah chapter 3, you will see very specific references to individual families building either their own houses, repairing the one opposite them, repairing the wall next to them, repairing the wall around them, specific families taking charge of specific areas. And as the families took charge of these areas, the general body took part of the other area. That's how the wall was built. That means that individual families must work together and then we as a church family must work together. The church must continue to be a place where we can call and rally around for prayer for the family. For the family. We need families that will stand in the gap. Imagine if you were there and functioning as a family of faith stationed in a weak area of our world today to pray for a family, to pray for their children, to pray for the relationship of husband and wife. To pray that the man will not just be a man society says is a good man, but a man that the Bible approves that this is the character of Christ. To pray that the wife will be a wife that reflects the character of Christ. Not that she's a loving wife, she's, she's okay, but it's the character of Christ that would always take the day. Rally the family. Rally the family to pray. Rally the family to pray for you. Let them know what the situation is. Sadly, we can't rally the family anymore because a lot of us in the family are fighting with the family and not fighting for the family. Within the church, we are fighting ourselves, so I cannot share my problem with you. When the family is fighting itself, there can never be peace for us to pray together. Nehemiah tells them, remember your God. I love this part. So after looking at everything over and sensing the discouragement that was going on within his team, Nehemiah refocused his troops and look at verse 14 that we have read. Don't be afraid of them. Do what? Remember the Lord. Do what? Remember the Lord. This Lord you have to remember, he is great and awesome. Nehemiah knew that even in the face of opposition, that the success that they were going to have will be, will be dependent on God. Remember the Lord who is awesome. Remember the Lord who is indeed great. Child of God, remember the Lord who is your strength. Child of God, remember the Lord who has told you that his banner over you is love. Child of God, remember the Lord who calls prodigal sons and parents back home. Remember the Lord who never loses a battle. Remember the Lord who is your good shepherd. Remember the Lord who has asked you to call him in the day of trouble. Remember the Lord who remains a great deliverer. Remember the Lord who has told you to come before his throne boldly that you might find grace and find mercy in your time of need. Child of God, let discouragement not take your mind away from the Lord, but that you remember the Lord who has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. Let discouragement and fear not take your attention from the Lord God Almighty who has promised that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Amen. Remember the Lord. Who hasn't forgotten you? Does your home seem unmanageable? You can't manage it anymore, unmanageable. You're about to throw in the towel. 
I give up. I can't take it no more. You are just halfway into the fence. So let me tell you something to help you know why I say you are halfway. So the studies that I told you about that gives you the seven stages of marital adjustment says for you to reach the stage of marriage, if you try and you are fast, if you try and you are fast, you would have spent about 13 years, then you can say I'm married. For now, you're still learning the ropes. That's your fast. <laughs> so there are people who take 15 years, 16 years, some 20 years before they reach the stage and say they're married. That's why when you see the older people who are married, there's nothing to fight against. They've reached the stage where we're not going anywhere. We either make ourselves happy or we'll be frustrated. Why? They all of a sudden forgot and then woke up. And some of us who are at that stage have not learned from them. They forgot that the children that used to keep them happy. Never ever say you are in your marriage because of your children. You have lost that battle. The children will go and you would wake up and find yourself just both of you. That's why I jokingly said when my children went to boarding school, they say, you send them to boarding school. And I jokingly tell, my, I tell people, I say, we are practicing retirement. The only difference is then we'll be older. Now we are still young. That's your reality. So when you get to that stage, so by the time they are 16, 17, they are going from the home, then you will now know whether two of you are really married or you have just been cohabiting. Because when there's a distraction in children, it will take away the reality of two of you. But let me assure you, your children are passengers in that bus. They must drop. Didn't you drop? <laughs> Didn't you drop out of your father's house? Didn't you drop out of the house? Some of you are even ready to drop now. We are trusting God for somebody to pick you when you drop. So why do you think your children will be there forever? That you want to live your life around people that are passengers. The driver and the conductor in the bus start the journey together, both of them. Pick passengers on the way, but none of those passengers is as close to them as both of them. They drop the passenger. At the end of the day, what happens to the driver and the conductor? The bus goes back, only two of them. But you know what? Both of them are tired. That's marriage. The children will go. But you'll be old. Look at Uncle Catch. Daddy Nick. I'm happy they sit in front. It makes it easy for me. Daddy Rabo. They're tired. It's tired. God has become their Baba. They're tired. The shoe they wear, except Uncle Catch, that by the grace of God, the guy is in his blood. So he still tries to maintain as a young boy. But look at Daddy Nick. We're praying for him every day. Can wear anything. They don't care. They don't care anymore, Daddy Rabbo. They don't care. It's still we that are trying to find which shoe matches, which socks matches, which shirt. These guys wake up in the morning. What do I have? All right, let's, where are we going? In fact, sometimes they don't even ask where they are going. You see them when they come out and you look at them. Are we going to the same place? They don't care. And you will get there. You will get there. Let the important thing be two of you. You will get there. Stay remembering your marriage. Stay connected. Stay connected is the last thing our time is gone. Stay connected. Apart from rallying your family, remembering your God, stay connected. Look at verse 20, if you may, of chapter 4. I like that verse. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Can I plead that this be a trumpet call? Can I plead that this message is a trumpet call to you today? That when you hear this message, you will join us together. And I like how the sequence of the verse goes, especially in the NIV. It says, when we join together, our God will fight for us. Our God will fight for us. When we come together, our God will fight for us. When we come together, we can conquer more. When we come together, we are stronger together. If you go away from the herd of cattle, it's easier for you to be attacked. 
I hope you know if you watch National Geographic Wild, you will notice lions and hyenas and tigers, they don't attack animals that stay together. They wait. They just walk around to see one that will leave the fold. Because when you leave the fold, you don't have your brothers and your sisters, as it were, to protect you. Just watch National Geographic. It's strategic. They row. In fact, some studies say that the lion rows when things get difficult. He rows. And when he rows, because the echo echoes around, the animals begin to run. In the bid to run, one person strays away because he's afraid because he had a row and strays into danger. I hope you also realize that however strong some of you should watch, however strong a lion is, when a lion strays away and is alone and a collection of hyenas get the lion, that lion is dead. Why? They strengthen togetherness. <laughs> Will you rally around when we hear this call? Will you rally around? Let's pray for ourselves. Let's pray for our families. Let's pray that our homes will be stronger. Let's pray that these obstacles that you are facing will come to an end because God will fight on your behalf. Join us here. Our God will fight for us. May this be a trumpet call. Let's pray together. Would you please permit that we pray? Would you pray for yourself? Are you fighting for your family? Or are you fighting with your family? I don't know what stage you're in. And I don't know what struggle you're facing. But fight. Because this God will fight for you. Fight. He will fight for you. Or maybe your home is all doing fine. Would you ask God to strengthen you? The enemy within has taken over. So the enemy without is having a field day. It might be difficult, but I will ask you to pray for yourself. To pray that God would help your home. To pray that God will help your future home. To pray that God will help you as a mother taking care of children because we can't understand but your loved one is no more. And you're all alone. Sometimes it's hard. Pray that God will help you to know that he's with you. That you consistently remember your God would you just tell him, I will fight with my, I will not fight with my family, I will fight for my family. Some of you have extended family members, uncles, aunties, cousins, nephews, nieces. You are fighting with them. I mean fighting, literally fighting with them. You don't show the light of Jesus Christ. Please talk to God. I beg you. Let this be a trumpet call that we rally around together and God will fight for our homes. For future homes that will be built that God will fight. Fight. That you won't fight. You won't fight with your family. You will fight for your family. Our God and our Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And believe that healing has started in homes today. We trust that healing has started in homes today. We've been fighting with ourselves. 
Help us to stop, stop fighting with ourselves and start fighting for our families. Fighting for peace in our homes. Sometimes we have to fight alone, oh God. The opposition is heavy, but help us to deal with the enemy within us. Pride and the fruit of the spirits that, is, that are absent help us that we would have those and you have promised that you will fight for us. Heal our homes, O oh God. 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 We ask this, O oh God, because, Lord, some are smiling. We don't even know, but they know what they are passing through. And yet they drive to church together, some separately, and smiling church. But, Lord, their home needs healing. Heal our homes, O oh God. Give us a testimony of healing. Some are in pain right now as we speak because they are struggling. With the conviction of your Holy Spirit, they are in pain. They don't want to leave what they are holding on to. They feel cheated. Oh God, help them know that peace is present and available. Heal our homes, oh God. Heal our homes, oh God. Give us victory, oh God. Some, yes, Lord, they were definitely cheated. They feel cheated. They know they were cheated. But heal our homes, oh God. Your example covers all that we can bring as a complaint. Help us to know that it is when we are like you, you fight for us. Heal our homes, oh God. Heal our homes, oh God. Heal our homes, O oh God. Lord, thank you for what you are doing already. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for victory. Thank you. For your children who are receiving victory, thank you. They are pained, but because they trust you, they are saying, I will try again. They are pained, but because they trust you, they are saying, I will try again. Oh, Lord, heal our homes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By the grace of God today, the title of our song is All I Have to Give. As you listen, may you be blessed in Jesus' name.
have a bank anyway But I won't let it affect my presentation to you This is what I bring Here is my heart, my mind Lord, here's my life, my everything Oh, yeah, it's 
thank you for joining us. We are sure you are blessed. Please follow our social media platforms, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at Echo Asukuro and visit our website, www.echoasukuro.com. Have a blessed week and see you again.